Why don't you uh, say a few words to our audience uh, watching us online and tell us uh, about what you've been working on and what, you, what your general uh, observation and thoughts about the cryptocurrency regulations. Well, I'm just honored to be here for my first trip to Asia and getting a chance to meet some of the community here in Asia and um, learn some new ideas about how we might approach regulation in the United States. But I think um, we're all on a path of learning together and trying to figure out what the right approach is. And just wanted to um, to welcome people to come visit me, come talk to me, and give me your ideas. It's especially an honor for me to be in Singapore, which is by many accounts the crypto the global crypto hub and so it's really been wonderful to experience the hospitality of the people here at the university and more broadly here in singapore and it's it's really um, nice for me to be able to learn about what's happening here in singapore and see whether um, we can draw some lessons from what's happening here back in the united states when i go back there uh, before I begin my remarks, I really need to note that the views that I express are my own views and not necessarily those of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission or my fellow commissioners. And one view that I undoubtedly am alone in having is my perspective on panda bears. So black and white pandas are all the rage in the United States. They're, um, they're very, very popular there. We. Um, we pay a lot of attention to when they have babies, and we watch them on little panda cams uh, when they're at the zoo, and the line at the zoo is extremely long to go see the black and white pandas. And I do, you know, they're adorable. I, I'll admit they're adorable, but I find them a bit pedestrian. And I actually think red pandas are much more exciting than black and white pandas. You may not know what red pandas are. They're also known as lesser pandas. Um, but they're much more interesting. And so I was excited to come to Asia in part because I'm a little bit closer to the habitat of red pandas. Now I understand that here in Singapore, they're, they're not native to Singapore. There are some, I think, um, here at the River Safari Wildlife Park. Um, but it is nice to be a little closer to where, they're, where they actually hail from. We do have uh, a red panda in DC, and that was actually, we have a, a nice zoo in, in Washington, DC, and that was what initially got my interest in red pandas was that we have a red panda named Rusty. Rusty the red panda um, one day became famous because he escaped. He made a daring break for freedom by climbing up a tree out over and he was free, a free, a free, not a free man, a free red panda, um, running around Washington DC. He was eventually captured, but not before he started a Twitter account um, and reported on his, his whereabouts. Um, but as it turns out, Rusty is not unusual. Red pandas make breaks for freedom all the time. You can do a Google search for red panda escapes and you'll find a whole list, Washington State, North Dakota, Australia, and Ireland, just to name a few. They, they get out all the time. And a few of these red pandas have been on the loose for quite some time. So, I think red pandas offer a nice contrast to black and white pandas that just sit in front of a panda cam eating, munching on bamboo um, and looking cute. I'm not advocating zoo breaks for red pandas. Let me just make that clear. But I do think that they have a little lesson for us. Their seemingly innate desire to explore the world outside of the fences uh, offer an inherent um, that's sort of inherent in them, and I think it offers a symbol for human innovation. Innovators also like to explore the world outside the fences. They don't like to be constrained by conventional human thinking. They, they, they're looking for new ways to solve old problems. Um, and they, they find better, cheaper, faster ways to do things. For regulators, such fence jumping can be quite unwelcome. It's easier to deal with entities that we know doing things in ways with, that we're familiar with seeing them do things. Um, we like to you know, deal with the old players rather than think about new players and new technologies. We'd rather turn the panda cam on, get a glimpse of what's going on, sit back in our chairs, and you know, have a little more predictability. And I think it's, it's this problem that we see in the regulation of blockchain and cryptocurrency, we're forced to get out of our chairs, 
turn off the Panda Cam, or maybe keep it on in the background, but look around and see what's going on with the red pandas out there. Because so much of the activity is taking place outside of the United States, we have to think, we as US regulators, need to think about our regulation with a sensitivity to the fact that this is a global issue and there are cross-border considerations. Um, we have to cooperate with our fellow regulators and we have to learn with them about these issues. The challenges of cross-border regulation are not new. Uh, we have seen them accelerate in recent years as technology has, has facilitated the integration of our world. Of course, we all think of the internet, um, but Americans have been, our, our markets have been global from time past, you know, from the colonial period in the US, they have been integrated with the rest of the world. And now we just see that really accelerating with technology. Cross-border transactions now occur almost instantaneously without either party ever leaving the, their country's own shores. In 1987, then acting SEC Chairman Charles Cox testified before a congressional subcommittee as a result of a number of factors, including technological advances and the removal of restrictions on foreign participation by many of the world's securities markets, internationalization is more than a developing trend, it's a present day reality. And a law text from 1991 remarks on the increased globalization of the capital markets facilit facilitated by fiber optics, microwave relay, and the satellite. So how much more internationalized are our markets now? Um, today, we have more than 800 foreign issuers registered with the SEC. Foreign investors regularly deploy their assets um, to fund U.S. listed companies. Foreign companies come to the U.S. to raise funds, and U.S. Inve investors proactively look for opportunities outside of the U.S. to diversify and grow their own portfolios. Investment advisors, broker dealers, clearing houses, and trading venues from outside the United States serve clients in the United States. In addition, our derivatives markets are um, global. Companies look to wherever in the world they can find a counterparty who's willing to take on risks and help them manage their risk. And that's a very healthy thing um, for, for us to make sure that we spread risk to the right parties who can bear it. Um, so our regulation of, of companies based in other jurisdictions has required the U.S. and, and the, the, the U.S. SEC and our Congress to think about how our rules can and should apply to companies wishing to access our capital markets. In some cases, we've simply required that foreign companies comply with the same rules as their domestic companies. Uh, in other cases, we have decided that we can make some exemptions, um, and we've for example, we have a, a Regulation S framework for foreign companies um, that permit them to use slightly different standards, and we also allow companies to use a different, we use US GAAP in the, as our accounting um, framework in the US, but we have allowed foreign issuers to use IFRS. Regulators' concerns today about cross-border regulation of digital assets in many ways mirrors these sort of more traditional concerns that we've had in our more general consideration of how to regulate cross-border activity. These concerns include the fear that we'll not be able to examine foreign entities reg registered to operate in our markets, and more generally that our ability to enforce domestic rules will be stymied by our inabil inability to um, regulate outside our borders. We also have to think about whether the application of our, our rules makes sense, is consistent with what investor expectations are. If the investors, the platforms on which they are transact transacting, the companies in which they are investing are all operating in one country, the investor can easily figure out that it's that country's rules that apply. But things get a bit more complicated when multiple jurisdictions are involved. Another regulatory concern is understanding which assets will be available to meet domestic obligations if a foreign entity fails and making sure that investors, uh, we understand how investors will be protected if something bad happens. The cross-border regulatory concerns in crypto track these standard concerns, but are magnified, I think, for several reasons. First, countries all over the world are still in the very initial stages of trying to figure out how do we regulate in this space. So we've got a lot of uncertainty about 
what the rules are, and that makes it much more difficult to determine which rules, which countries' rules even apply. Second, much of the allure of cryptocurrency is the ability to join people from all across the world in common enterprises, which makes pin pinning down a domicile for any particular entity pretty difficult or for these, for these um, worldwide distributed projects, it's really hard to figure out where they're based. And third, the precise nature, currency, commodity, security, derivative of many of the assets at issue is really difficult to determine. So we're seeing academics and regulators thinking through how to deal with these issues in the digital asset context. And to address cross-border regulatory concerns, regulators have had to follow the lead of market participants and work together with their foreign counterparts. So we have, uh, we're, we're active participants in the International Organization of Securities Commissions, which is a consortium of the world's um, securities regulators. And that was formed back in the 1980s, but it, it continues today to, provor, to provide us a nice forum where we can discuss issues with cross-border um, implications. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which was formed after World War II, is also thinking through some of these cross-border regulatory issues. And then since the, the financial crisis in 2007 to 2009, we have seen some new organizations, including the Financial Stability Board, which brings together regulators, central banks, and other regulators from across the world to, to think about issues related to financial stability. These organizations have all given some thought to digital assets and um, coordinating on regulation, thinking through some of the issues together. And so I think that's positive that we can work with our partners on that. That doesn't mean that we need to have internationalized regulations, even in an area like this. I think absent an explicit decision by citizens in, in a particular country to hand over their regulatory um, responsibility to an international organization, we have to remember that each country, each jurisdiction should be determining the rules that work for its own citizens and its own markets. But we can look to our fellow regulators for shared consideration of difficult issues and coordination, just not regulatory directives. In the case of, de of the developing realm of digital asset regulation, many countries are working on regulatory frameworks to address the novel challenges that these assets present. Although the existence of many jurisdictions can create regulatory friction, it also can create regulatory competition, which is healthy because it enables us to learn from one another and to see what works and what doesn't. Um, you know, we in the US have this regulatory competition built into our system automatically because we're a federation of sovereign states and these states um, and territories in the District of Columbia, they can all do their own thing unless we have a federal rule that preempts the states. And so that diversity has made our states what we call laboratories of democracy. And so different states try different things, and if something works well in one state, other states can look and say, hey, will that work for us, or are we different in some way that would not make it work for our state? Um, we can see that sometimes there are difficulties when state laws conflict. In fact, we've, we've also seen that it can be burdensome to have to comply with all these different state laws. We've seen that in the digital asset context, um, among many others, as, as companies find they have to register, some companies involved in the space have to register with each state in which they're engaged, and that can be a pretty burdensome process. So sometimes Congress comes in and says, you know what, we're going to just preempt the states and we're going to say we need a federal, federal rule that applies everywhere. And that ha is ha has happened in some areas of the securities laws. Um, but I think just as states are taking different approaches on things, we see different nations now taking different approaches with respect to digital assets and blockchain. Um, I've often expressed my concern that the U.S. is actually falling behind and that we're seeing other countries that have been more, more forward-thinking in how they approach this space have been attracting a lot of innovators to their shores. And I think we at the SEC owe it to ourselves to take a look at what those countries are doing and try to learn from what they're doing. Um, 
and we see that here in Singapore. We see that there's a lot of activity going on here, and so that's something that we want to take a look at. So, in short, my fondness for, for competition doesn't just, doesn't just relate to the markets, but also to the regulatory context. As I've expressed, um, I do wish that the SEC would be a little bit more forward-thinking and would be moving a little bit more in a more focused um, direction in, in this area. Um, we don't have a lot of clarity still in the U.S., and that's been, that's been troublesome. Um, but we haven't been sitting idle. We have been doing a, a couple things, and so let me, let me tell you a little bit about what we've been doing in the U.S. The most basic but essential of the steps that we've taken is that we've really tried to learn more about this market. We've tried to understand how, how blockchain works, how cryptocurrencies work. Um, and so to that end, we established a strategic hub for innovation and in financial technology, quite a mouthful, so we call it FinHub. And that is a collection of all the staff in the SEC um, focused on these issues, and they help coordinate all of the activities at the SEC on that issue. And so there's, there's sort of a central point that people can approach um, for guidance about what we're doing in this area and to ask questions and that sort of thing. At the end of May, the, the Fin Hub um, held a one-day FinTech forum, which brought people in from the outside to talk about issues arising in key areas such as capital formation, secondary trading, um, markets, and investment management. The, the, um, all of this was in the context of digital assets. They explored with us and provided us insight into how ICOs proceed, what issues auditors are facing in auditing digital assets, how brokers can think about custody issues, and what investors might consider in deciding um, whether to buy assets, what, what advisors might consider in deciding whether to buy assets for their, um, for their funds that they manage or their cl other clients. One of the peculiarities of the U.S. system is that we have lots of regulators. As I said, we, the states have a role to play in regulation, but we also have a lot of regulators at the federal level. So we're one of two capital markets regulators, the SEC is. We share that jurisdiction with the CFTC, and then we have a number of banking regulators as well. Um, and then we actually also have these quasi-governmental regulators that regulate alongside with us, uh, alongside of us. One of those is the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, um, which regulates broker-dealers. We also see exchanges um, have a self-regulatory function in the United States. So there, there are a lot of players in this space, and that makes it a little bit more complicated. Another notable feature of the U.S. law is that the definition of what constitutes a security is a bit nebulous. Um, unlike many other countries, we don't just have a simple definition that says, here's what's in, here's what's out. We have, uh, you know, obviously some things are in, like stocks, bonds, um, notes, those types of things are, are in. But um, there's also this category called the investment contract, and that's a much more ambiguous category, and that's one where a lot of the focus in the digital asset space has been because that's typically the bucket that they would fall in if they fall in, in any of these buckets. And so rather than having a definition in the statute, this has been something that our courts have come to define. And they do that when someone comes with a, with a case, they're the facts of the particular case, and they say, we have this particular type of asset. Does this qualify as an investment contract? And the courts will come back and say, yes, it does, or no, it doesn't. So in the grandfather of these cases, which I'm sure some of you in this room have heard about, SEC versus Howey, our Supreme Court established a test for determining whether something was an investment contract, and therefore a security. Um, Howey involved interest in, in an orange grove, so it's clear that you can't tell whether something's a security by just looking at the way it um, looks or smells or feels, um, but you have to actually do a little analysis, and so um, we see with, with Howie that um, what they're looking at is, is it an investment in a common enterprise with an expectation of profits solely derived from, uh, through the efforts of others? In July 2017, six months before I joined the commission, um, the SEC did issue a report on, uh, on the Dow, which some of you may have heard about, and, and that was an organization which had sold digital assets with the intention of using the proceeds to then fund projects. 
and um, the curator, curators of this of the DAO would pick out a list of projects, and then the participants could vote on which of those projects would get funded. The commission concluded that selling these digital assets, that that was actually a sale of securities. And that became sort of the baseline. And then after that, we had um, some additional enforcement actions that also found that there were other token sales that were, that were sales of unregistered um, securities. And so we brought enforcement actions there. And then we've also, of course, brought some enforcement actions when there was just outright fraud in the securities, uh, in the sale of digital tokens. That's sort of a whole separate category of cases, but I think it can be a very useful category of cases in making sure that this space is one that has integrity and that um, people see that we're, if you, if you go out and you, do, you commit fraud in the name of crypto, that's still something that we're going to go after. In April of this year, the staff issued a statement outlining a framework for analyzing whether a digital asset may be an investment contract and thus a security under our law. The framework includes lots of factors that um, someone contemplating a token offer offering could look at to decide whether they need to do this under the securities laws or not. Um, last month, the SEC staff also issued a second guidance document. This time it was joint with FINRA, the self-regulator, the quasi-governmental regulator that I mentioned earlier. Um, and that has to do with the question of, of um, when a digital asset um, how digital assets can be custodied um, and how customers who own these assets are protected if something goes wrong, what specific challenges the secondary, um, secondary markets might, might um, give rise to in this area as well. So um, there's a whole range of issues that that guidance deals with. Again, like the first guidance, it doesn't provide clear um, rules that you can say, oh yes, I understand exactly how this works, but it provides some insights into our thinking and also provides some insights into some of the questions that are still troubling us in this area. So I, I commend that to those of you who are thinking about this area. Um, but the staff has taken some more proactive steps as well. Um, so we had a, um, a couple of token offerings were qualified under Regulation A+, which is a way that you can actually do a a mini IPO, um, and so we saw a couple of those just happen a few weeks ago. We also saw the staff issue two no action letters, which basically says it's the staff's promise to someone that they're not going to recommend an enforcement action to us, the commissioners, if people do things in the way that they lay out in the letter. So there are certain conditions that apply, uh, and those conditions then can be instructive to other people who are thinking about this space as well. Um, the conditions in these letters are quite restrictive and elsewhere I've noted that I have some concerns about how, the, how um, particularly the first of these letters um, worked, but it's still, I think, at least something out there that shows people that you can go to the SEC and you can get some answers, which is helpful. And then we just saw uh, FINRA approve a couple of broker-dealer applications as well, and there may be others that could come in the, in the future. Um, and these are broker dealers that deal with digital assets. So as I said, the US is just one of the jurisdictions that's trying to confront these questions about digital assets. Um, Singapore, as you likely know better than I do, has been at the forefront of much crypto related activity, but I think that may be attributable to the clarity that's offered here um, to issuers in this market. In a recent paper by, um, Robbie and Professor Lee, they describe the link between the clarity of Singapore's regulatory approach and the leading role that Singapore, Singapore plays as a home to digital asset projects, including notably a relatively high proportion of proje projects that have, uh, quote, resulted in operational networks or minimum viable products. Elsewhere in Asia, regulators have found paths to drawing digital, assets, uh, digital asset offerings into their country's regulatory frameworks. Thailand established a regulatory framework in 2018 specifically for digital assets. Um, this framework designates some assets as cryptocurrency and some as securities depending on how they're used. Those uh, serving as digital asset brokers, exchanges, or dealers must obtain a license and comply with specific regulatory requirements 
Japan has passed legislation to bring securities offerings of digital assets within its existing legal framework for securities offerings. Um, this follows the 2017 adoption of a registration regime for cryptocurrency exchanges. In Hong Kong, the Securities and Futures Commission has released guidance starting, stating that security tokens are likely to be securities under the Hong Kong securities laws, which is similar to where we are, um, but they've also issued a circular requiring funds, um, the virtual currencies of which exceed 10% of aggregate, uh, aggregate assets to be licensed by the SFC, and um, another which places cryptocurrency trading platforms in a regulatory sandbox. In Europe, Malta, a relatively early adopter of crypto regulation, passed legislation in 2018 that separates digital assets into um, unregulated virtual tokens and regulated virtual financial assets. Switzerland also acted early. Uh, it provided preliminary guidance for ICOs in 2017 and issued more detailed guidance than in 2018. France recently announced a new licensing regime for initial coin offerings and digital asset service providers. This regi regime um, is optional for some activity but mandatory for providers of digital asset custody services to third parties. And then Bermuda is one of, is one of the only uh, jurisdictions that's really addressed the custody issue in detail. That's an issue that we're, we're looking at at the SEC and I think other jurisdictions are as well. Um, in conjunction with a regulatory regime for digital asset businesses, Bermuda also released draft guidance for crypto custodial services, which addresses such difficulties as how to store private keys for hot and cold storage while preserving necessary liquidity, what safeguards should be in place to prevent unauthorized access, and how to frame internal audit of transactions to ensure that their integrity. So these are laboratories of, of regulation, and they have me thinking about possible paths for us in the United States. Um, so that we could become a bit more welcoming of crypto innovation. After all, we need some red pandas in the U.S. too. We can't have them all be here. Um, so I look forward to learning more, for example, from the Bermuda custody framework that I just discussed. But motivated in part by, my, um, by the approach that Singapore has taken, which doesn't treat every token offering as a securities offering, I would support the creation of a non-exclusive safe harbor for the offer and sale of certain tokens. The SEC's Director of Corporation Finance, who's spoken a lot on these issues, uh, Bill Hinman, pointed out in a speech about a year ago that if a token network were to become sufficiently decentralized, that tokens that were issued as securities might no longer be securities. They might be utility tokens. It's not clear to me how this, trans how this transformation could actually happen, though, if the tokens were initially offered as securities. How can decentralization be accomplished in that framework? For tokens that are designed to serve an, as an alternative method of payment online or as utility tokens, deeming every transaction um, a securities transaction, um, whether that transaction is used to compensate developers or... Um, you know, for use within the, within the actual network, I think it almost surely would eliminate the possibility that that kind of a transformation to a utility token could actually occur to a functioning network. So you want to make sure that, that the network is able to be up and running, and it seems like that is much more difficult if you're treating these things as securities. So as Robbie and, and Professor Lee point out, quote, open digital token offerings facilitate participation in open source software development and create a sense of empowerment and ownership, thus mobilizing programmers to test and improve the underlying software. That kind of empowerment is really difficult when distribution is, is, has to operate under the existing securities laws. A non-exclusive safe harbor would permit issuers to offer tokens under an alternative regime with robust requirements, the relief could be time limited to guard against reliance on the safe harbor just to um, have projects that have no workable plan to becoming a functioning network to raise money. You want to have some kind of constraint on that. Um, the requirements that would go with this kind of a safe harbor would be tailored to the needs of purchasers di of digital assets um, in a way that our current regulations just really aren't designed for that. They're designed to get 
purchasers of more traditional securities the information they need to make decisions about whether to invest. Um, so trading to get the tokens in and out of the hands of developers and users I think would have to be permitted under this kind of a framework. Disclosures, um, the, the question of what disclosures might be relevant, I think some academics have been thinking about this question. Um, Professor Chris Brummer, among others, has pointed out that information that token purchasers want is not necessarily the same as the information that the securities laws would give them. Uh, there have been some legislative proposals to exempt token offerings um, that, that also recognize that the securities framework may not be the appropriate one for um, all tokens. A token offering made in reliance on the safe harbor that I'm thinking of would have to comply with certain requirements. That Some of those disclosures might be clear disclosure of the asset's functionality, including the mechanisms um, for, cha for changing holders' rights and explaining how funds are to be used. And um, we had, as I mentioned, we had this FinTech forum uh, a month or so ago. And one of the participants there explained the types of disclosures that are particularly relevant how many tokens have been issued, what the process is for issuing more, how to address inconsistencies between a plain English description of the tokens and what the actual code says. Um, so those are some of the things that we could think about. As such a safe harbor I've envisioned to be non-exclusive, which means it wouldn't be the only way that you could comply with our securities laws, but it would be one way that you could approach this. It's obviously a very preliminary concept, needs a lot of work. Um, and uh, I think it might be a way, though, to help some of the activity um, happen in the United States with a little bit, within a little bit of a clearer framework. Whatever direction we do go in the United States, continued communication with our fellow regulators across the world will be important. I believe that we don't need a single regulatory framework, but we can create a healthy environment by sharing information with one another about the, the approaches that we take and by trying to smooth cross-border transactions. Um, I want to thank you all for being here today and, and helping me to think through some of the issues surrounding these recent technological innovations. Having the opportunity to meet with innovators is really one of the highlights of my job. Indeed, just yesterday I met with a number of crypto projects here and from, from the region and um, also with regulators and innovators. Um, yesterday uh, we, afternoon we had a chance to, to discuss some of these issues. I hope that others will visit me in Washington, D.C. I also greatly hear about, uh, enjoy hearing about the work of traditional market participants. But for me, the people who are um, the red pandas, the ones who are constantly hopping outside of the fences of traditional thinking, make my life much more interesting as a regulator. I want to thank you. I know I'm a little bit over, but I, I'm happy to take questions if we have time or not if we don't have time. So I think we can do that. Um, I can, if anyone has a question, if not, we can move on to the panels. I think it was the FinTech Committee of the House of Congress was talking about um, introducing legislation to keep tech companies out of financial services. And I know there was a clause in there that said the tech company had to have turnover of greater than 25 billion. But it's kind of scary that they would start implementing stuff like that. How realistic do you think it is that stuff, that laws like this could get passed and start cutting off innovation for fintech companies? Well, I should preface my answer by saying I'm not, I'm, that's above my pay grade. I'm not uh, a politician, and I don't have any particular insights about politics either. You know, there's a lot of discussion now about a number of issues related to technology in the United States, and um, part of this is about digital assets. Part of it is about privacy. There's a lot of focus now on privacy in, in, uh, in the U.S. related to the big tech companies. And so I think that this is all part of the conversation we need to have to try to figure out what the path forward is. Um, I think Professor Lee has, has rightly placed an emphasis on privacy as one of the things that we need to think about. And so um, I view it as pretty healthy that we're having a broad-ranging discussion in the United States. It's, 
you know, it takes a long time from a, a proposal, typically, a, a bill being introduced or discussed um, to final legislation, and a lot can happen in the, in the interim. So I think we should just generally welcome these conversations, and all of you who have insights and things to say should participate in those conversations. It doesn't matter that you're not from the United States. We still value the input, so um, I really encourage everyone just to get engaged and help us think through these issues. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner Pierce, for your, for your ideas and insights. I think the the idea around a, a non non exclusive safe harbor could be really interesting. So I'd love to see how how that develops in those preliminary. I think I need your help in developing it. So <laughs> you know, you and everyone else, I really do welcome input on it. Yeah, um, could you for for the probably the most of this room for the non securities lawyers in this room, could you maybe help clarify what the concept of a non exclusive safe harbor is in the context of of securities laws and like what potentially actually getting something like that drafted and approved like what in generally speaking would that process look like so i mean there are two there are two potential routes one is you could have a legislative directive that we either establish a safe harbor like that or they could just do it themselves in congress they could draft something up and they could tell us what it would look like typically what happens in this space is that congress has given us a fair amount of leeway in what we can do and um, we, so we can take advantage of that ourselves as a commission and say, hey, we're looking at this new area and we think maybe this is a place where an exemption would, would be important. And we could draft that up either as um, some sort of a, a, a guidance document, but more likely it would be a, a reg, an exemption that we'd actually write into our regulations. Um, so that's a long process. I mean, I, you know, I, everything is a long process when it involves a regulator, I think, at least a regulator that has lots of rules on the books has been around for a while. So it would mean that we would put put something out for comment that would kind of lay out what a safe harbor would look like, and then we would get people's comments on it. And so the way I'm envisioning it, it would really be something that we would say, you know what, we're not even going to make you worry about whether this is a securities offering if you comply with these conditions. And I think this is where I really do need the help of people who have expertise like yours and others in the in the room who can help me think through both what those, what the right set of conditions would be, what kind of disclosures would we want to make sure that people are getting in this space, but also, um, you know, what do we do about trading of the, of the tokens? Because we do, I think the free flow, the ability of tokens to move to people who are actually involved in using the network and developing the network is really important. So I want to figure out how that would play in. Um, and then, you know, as I said, maybe you have a time limitation so that it pr provides a little discipline. And this is a little bit awkward because in a way we're saying we don't know whether or not this thing is a security, but if you want to just be exempt from having to comply with the laws with the securities regulatory framework as it is, just do these things and we're just, we're, we're just going to put you in a separate category. So we have a fair amount of flexibility to do things like that under the securities laws, but I think it will be a complicated thing to draft from a regulatory and a technical, a legal and a technical perspective. So please, anyone who has thoughts, um, let me know what they are. One, I'm only allowed to take one more, so I don't, I'm happy to talk to anyone after, but, um, all right. Should I do it with the guy who has the microphone or should I go to a different part of the room? You guys have to decide. All right, go for it. Shout. 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 Right. Shout. Hello, Commissioner Pierce. I'm Wigo from Block Temple. The leading media group for FinTech, FinTech in blockchain in Taiwan. So my question is, we've seen a lot of blockchain projects moving from decentralized to decentralized, like uh, DDAX and DeFi. So how can the regulators make a balance of this situation? Well, I mean, I think that's what I'm struggling with right now, right? I, I, I think the way that we have our framework set up, it's very hard to make that transition. And I think that's, that's obviously the core of what's in this space that we're excited about which is the idea that you can get more people involved in these projects and that you can be less centrally controlled and more decentralized. Um, and so I think 
it's up to both us as regulators to make that easier, but also you in the community. You know, if, if you're just trying to set up companies that do things, that's fine, but that's just a different model. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's always good for us as regulators and the rest of the, the society to see, wow, there's actually some real value into having a decentralized um, system. And so that is something that you can show and, and we can ease the road. And that's something that I'm trying to, to work on here. All right, I'll stop talking because I think we've got a lot more interesting things coming up. So thank you all very much. Thank you.